In this DVD, we'll look at what it's like to have a stroke, how the care we provide can influence the emotions of patients and family members, and in the last section, we'll look at some examples of good communication in practice. By having a better understanding of what it's like for stroke survivors and family members after a stroke, we can be more considerate in the care we provide. Taking the time to listen and understand what an individual is going through can have a powerful reassuring effect on the person. In this section, we have an opportunity to hear from three couples on what it's like to have a stroke. Here's Melvin Curl speaking about the onset of his stroke. I was sat in the conservatory doing a jigsaw puzzle. And uh, I've been in there for a couple hours and uh, I picked up a piece of puzzle, what I wanted, and I wanted to get it over there. My hand just wouldn't go over. He didn't tell me and I didn't, didn't recognise anything. We went to bed and in the morning he woke up. He went downstairs to make a cup of tea. By the time he brought my cup of tea back upstairs, I only had half a cup. He said, something wrong with me. He said, I can't, I'm more one-sided and I'm more funny. And that was the first time. So I said, right, back into bed. I said, and I'll ring for help. I went into the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I realised my eye had dropped and my face was changing. And I thought, I'm having a stroke. Crying out loud, I'm having a stroke. And those, you know, the way I, I thought, you stupid man, you're, you've got to do something. I was just leaving the WI and I had the stroke on the pavement outside. And um, the, the, they didn't know what was happening, but I just went, my legs gave way. And um, then they were concerned that I was on the pavement. So someone suggested that they got a seat and um, somebody said I should get her to hospital. So, and then the next thing, it was all taken out of my hands. I had a phone call to say that uh, she'd fallen down locally. So, of course, I jumped in the car and when I got there, the ambulance was actually there and somebody kindly lifted her and put her on some, some cushions. And I could hear the, um, the ambulance people saying, you know, trying to get her to talk to see what had actually happened. And I heard the stroke word mentioned. It was a sugar diabetes. I didn't know I had it, but they reckon that's what triggered it off. But I, I didn't have a very severe stroke. It's just that the uh, left hand side went and my mouth went skew and slurred speech and that. But uh, I was only in there about four or five days and they let me out. Peggy nursed Melvin during his recovery but soon the roles were reversed. Well, I went into Yeovil Hospital for a complete hip replacement. And I had my operation on the 19th of December. And while I was on the table having my operation, I had the spinal stroke. And uh, nobody knew anything about it, because when I come back into the ward, it was about half 11 on the Saturday morning, I phoned my husband, I said, I had my operation. I said, I feel fine. I phoned him up. I said, I feel fine. He said, good. He said, see you later. And that was it. Until the next morning, they went to get me out of bed and I couldn't stand. They wondered why. And then they'd done some tests and discovered that I'd had a spinal stroke. When I got back home and I looked up and saw all the photograph of her, and then I got upset because um, they told her she'd probably be disabled for the rest of her life. And she's so active. Well, it's when I was, it was outside, the, my, my um, phone clipped in as soon as I got outside in the car park, and it went beep, 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 and I thought, oh, I'll look at that in a moment. Got all the shopping in the car, just going to wheel the trolley back, and I looked at it and saw three messages from Tony on there and I thought I bet he's forgotten something grinning to myself and asked me to go back and get it and when I listened I was just horrified <laughs> through the trolley trolley at some poor people who were there got in the car and I sorry I'm going to get emotional I screamed all the way home 
I either thought I was going to be like a vegetable uh, comatose the rest of my life, or I was going to be dead. I, I really felt so bad. Um, I, I was kind of like the end of the world was coming. It was a most peculiar feeling. He didn't see what I was feeling. I thought that was very important, that he didn't see me cry or, you know, um, that I was there for him. I think it's a, an important thing that um, you, you're very strong. Well, it was terrible because um, she, she just didn't, didn't know who I was at all. And uh, uh, she would keep sort of looking as if she was trying to get some recognition, but there was just uh, nothing there. I don't remember too much about the, um, going to A&E because I le went to Yeovil Hospital and I don't remember too much about being in there overnight. Um, I just vaguely remember things happening around me and the next thing I heard my husband say, well I'm going home now and you're going to stay here. Um, and um, I woke up in the ward. It was some time before she remembered anything because I have a son who lives in Germany and my daughter was in London and my son panicked and I did explain to him that really he, it was too soon for him to come and see her but they both insisted on coming over um, which up them, upset them considerably because she just did not she didn't know any of us and it took me perhaps a mm, couple of weeks um, by prompting and things like that before uh, I would mention Stan and she would look and probably nod and that's about as far as, far as we could get for some time. There was somebody there constantly so I wasn't really aware too much of what was happening except something was happening all the time. I was all the time touching Tony, reassuring him. That's all I could do, really. <laughs> I did go outside and have a little weep, <laughs> came back in again. All I know is that I lost my speech, so I was not able to communicate, but I was able to understand what people were saying to me. So I knew that it was all in my mind, but um, I couldn't voice anything, and I had to learn to speak again. She'd come on leaps and bounds since she'd been home and the physio had been coming out and seeing her. And uh, she's come on leaps and bounds. She's walking with two sticks now. And but in here, she was wheeled about everywhere. I mean, I didn't feel well in myself to start with. I thought, ooh, you know, but then once I started feeling a bit better in myself, you know, I thought, cool, I'd love to be able to walk. I want to get, I mean, I'm striving to do things now. I want to now get back to driving. We managed. And uh, they were very good here. They put in the banister so that she could go upstairs and put the things on the toilets and one thing or another so she could get about better. And uh, I've bought a little electric scooter, you know, an inverted scooter. So, like, if we go to Yeovil, I put it in the boot of the car. We go off to Yeovil, and she can go around Yeovil on it, and things like that. But uh, otherwise, she's doing very well. Doing better than I thought she was going to do. I've had to learn to cook, and I uh, had to learn to wash her, dress her, and all those, all those things, and the commode and that that sort of thing, which. Um, well, one's never heard about these things in their life at the time, you know, but uh, uh, you knew it had to be done and, uh, and that was it. And once the cooking and iron and that sort of come in, uh, it made life much easier. She was certainly happier, yeah. I've learnt to do the things that I can do and um I, I do a, a lot now. I mean, I have carers come in and they um, uh, get me dressed and everything else. Um, but I do, there's lots of things I can do for myself. And um, 
I uh, try and clump up the cushions with one hand. I mean, you, you never lose that sense of being a housewife, do you? And, and I just get so frustrated that I can't do the ironing and um, the cooking and all the things that I can't do. But there's things you can do. There are, yes. As we've seen, strokes often come out of the blue. Many patients don't know what is happening and can be very frightened. Families are also trying to make sense of what has happened and are keen to be involved in the care of their loved ones. Strokes often cause major disruption to people's lives and require considerable practical and emotional adjustments to be made. Coping with the impact, the loss and believing in your ability to build a life after stroke takes considerable effort, support and time. In this next section, let's look at how specific care received by patients and families affected them emotionally. Our first comments reflect on the importance of keeping people informed. When they said that I'd had a spinal stroke, I said, what? I thought, well, what does that mean? And of course, I mean, nobody can tell me much about it because there's not very much known about it. I was told yesterday by the doctor I saw yesterday about the hip, it's one in 10,000 people have it. And I just don't know. I'd like to know a little bit more information on it. Because I can't explain to people what the feelings are until, because there's nobody else had it and I got no information about it. This is my problem. A lot more information would have been a lot more helpful. I was really getting quite cross because I, I wasn't being told uh, and in the end I blew my top and uh, uh, got on to the secretary of the, the surgeon that was taking care of her and I was then given a two hour interview on exactly and I went through all the x-rays uh, to tell me exactly I mean, it was an eye-opener because the x-rays sort of went through a chopping off process to show where the, where the stroke was. And it's then, then you see the actual clot, then you realise what, what it is. Patience is vital. Remember, people are individuals. Give them time to express their needs. I couldn't remember to say bed jacket and it would take me ages and they could say, what is it you want? And I have to sort of, you know, point to things. And um, if I couldn't um, say what I wanted after a time, then they would just give up on me. And then um, I'd have to I'd get another one or something like that and uh, try and communicate to them. Yes, I was annoyed that I couldn't make them understand because I wanted to make them understand.